us to uh, make what we do at SSB accessible and uh, at least get people to understand what we do here. I think it's, it's uh, not often seen when people stop by the field or they come and fly for two or three months or, and, and then leave, uh, train up and then leave. But we have, I feel, one of the most advanced flying groups of people, I think, in the world here. And, and uh, it's been definitely been a pleasure to, to uh, fly with you all and learn from you all and, and chase each other around the sky a little bit. Um, let's, uh, if you guys have any questions, just, um, just speak up and we can, we can take a minute and, and uh, uh, see if we can answer some of those for you. But, uh, or, or you can send them in via uh, the chat and we'll get to the questions. All right. So let me go to our, uh, So this is uh, um, the intro basically to the 14er challenge on our website. And uh, the 14er challenge was proposed by the infamous Colin Berry, who I think is here tonight, as a, uh, an idea of um, magnanimous proportions, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, something that I don't know if, if it was ever finished. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, even in hang gliders. Um, it's quite difficult terrain for, for those uh, crafts. And uh, Colin came from the hang gliding realm as I did for about a week. Um, and he proposed this and has been following it through. And uh, there's been four people now that have finished this in various ways um, or you know, have done the have done the challenge, and um, it's uh, people we can all go fly with right now, which is really really amazing. Um, you can talk to people about this. You can inquire on how it's done, and we're all usually on the field every every week and and uh, definitely on the weekends. So feel free to corner us if you have any questions or if you have specific goals. You know, line them out and, and let's see what we can do, you know, to get you around these. Um, every one of us that have done it and even the more advanced pilots in the club can help you with this. So um, feel free to do that at any time. Um, the challenge in itself is uh, the um, idea of flying around the 14ers in Colorado. Uh, the, it's about, uh, they're all 14,000, a little bit more than 14,000. And we like to fly over these at uh, peak height or a little above, as, as much above as possible, and within a quarter mile of, of the, the, the uh, I guess it's a GPS dropped uh, pin. Um, there's some discussion about where that is exactly on a few of them, but um, it's uh, in our turn point, in our turn point folders, we have the 14ers uh, set up as a turn point file. Uh, take a look at those and uh, see how that looks to you and, and uh, use them locally before you try to go across country with them. And uh, you can kind of figure out how they work and uh, what you need to do to set in your half mile radius and uh, hit that radius. Um, that is, that's the sim simple part of it. Um, I think, I think the, the claims that uh, you will make, uh, if you put them on OLC, um, that's the best place for them. So everybody can kind of see them and um, uh, take a look and they can learn from them uh, you know, down, down, the, down the row. And um, it, it just helps everybody get, get an idea of what you've done and where you're at. And, and, uh, you know, and also you'll see later in my presentation how this can work out, uh, how we can see everybody's tracks Doing the, doing the 14ers and come up with uh, some really nice pathways for it to be a lot easier than uh, uh, the first the first 14 er So uh, the, the challenge is gonna run, and Colin, feel free to, to pop in here if you have any other input. Um, the challenge was, uh, it started on the May 2008 and it's gonna end in September, well, this year. Um, but I think uh, this is something that we really want to want to want to maintain and want to keep the challenge going. 
more than likely, Tom, I'm going to, it's going to be extended. Yeah. Yes, good, good, good. Um, Colin has been uh, very graciously uh, uh, providing the trophies and um, we all appreciate that, but we do understand that that's uh, not, not an inexpensive uh, endeavor. And hopefully after this, we're gonna have at least five or 10 of you people knocking these off uh, in, in the near future. Um, we, let's hope so. Um, Colin, can you think of anything else? Your presentation, Tom. Yeah, okay. Well, it's, I, I, I commend you on, the, uh, on the, 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 the challenge in itself. It, uh, it, it, it didn't initially appeal to me, but um, after a few years of flying, uh, I, I, I realized how difficult this was. And I, I wouldn't call it the Everest of, of flying, but it might be maybe the Everest of flying in Colorado. Um, flying triangles is great. Flying speed uh, is, is fabulous. And flying tasks is great. Um, but there's nothing like uh, this type of a challenge where you can set any task you want and think the weather is going to work however you want and you might just be out there all alone and needing to land out. So it's definitely uh, one of the most formidable challenges I've ever, I've ever seen. Um, I come, as, as Armand said, I come from the rock climbing and the cycling world. Uh, rock climbing is very, very similar to this. It's basically you and your equipment and how you feel that day uh, in, in, in relation to your uh, ability to accomplish something. And uh, in, my, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's, it's how you feel and your belief systems that will uh, give you the greatest success. Skills are easy in this sport. You can go learn how to thermal, you can, you can turn, your, turn your airplane, you can land it, and fly, fly fast, but uh, um, the challenge of this is definitely way, way above that. So um, it's, it's been a great challenge for me. So let's look here. Here is, uh, some of these images might take a while to come in on everybody's computers. Uh, so if, it's, if you need more time, just holler. Um, this is the smattering of, or the concentrations of the 14ers uh, in Colorado. Um, right close to us, we have Long's Peak. Uh, far away, we have Mount Calibra, the Sangre de Cristos, um, Elk Mountains, uh, and that down by Telluride, and the Aspen 14ers here. And it's somewhat up in the air. I think there's 56 now that, that, is, that are formalized in the entire count. Um, here are, is, is a general uh, mileage on, on these. You know, the Aspen chain is about 120 miles away. Uh, down by Calibra is about 240 and 210 miles to the farthest to the southwest that we have. Um, the, the challenge is to simply fly around the peaks. It doesn't, it, it isn't specific to where you take off. You don't need to do this from Boulder. Um, I initially did, uh, the, the peaks from various places like Salida and, uh, um, Crawford is where I did most of the, most of the first, uh, localized flying of those. And, um, Crawford, I don't believe has a tow plane anymore, but we do uh, do some uh, camps down at Salida, which will get you very, very close to all of these, a lot closer than Boulder. And I think that's where, you know, most of us have had, had the most ticks that we've uh, been able to get around is from Salida. Um, the, uh, I, would, I would highly recommend uh, doing whatever you need to do to feel comfortable initially in going after these. And that if that is, you know, get, getting, getting a camp together on your own to go out to Crawford or to Slida to do a 14-year camp, I would highly recommend it. Um, get four or five guys and, and go after this. 
Um, tow planes are becoming more and more scarce and um, everybody's buying motor gliders. <laughs> so um, it's gonna be, it's gonna become more and more difficult the longer and longer we wait to, to, to do this, to do these tasks. Um, so what is it, what is it, what are the elements of success that we need to look at to safely do this and do this in a way that uh, um, doesn't endanger our lives every single time we go do it? The big, the big items are the weather. Um, how, what is your process? Uh, Bob, Bob Ferris gave a really, really good uh, uh, weather uh, clinic a couple of weeks ago. Um, very, very helpful. And all of those, all of the tools that you can imagine is, are, are what you're going to need to use to be able to get, a, get closer to the uh, 14ers on the west side of the states, the state, and to the extreme south. Uh, the more weather models and the, and the better you, that you get with your weather, uh, the more success you're going to have. Um, geography. Where are you? Um, I, I remember doing a few of these and I had no idea where the hell I was, right? I just had, I had found myself in a place that I was like, well, gee, where is, where is Maroon, Maroon Peak? And, you know, what, what's next to it? I had no idea. I had no idea. So it's, it's, it's really good idea to kind of get familiar with where you're at in Colorado. Um, I think I think the uh, Google Earth is one of the one of the best ways to go about it, um, and or flying Condor, you know, get low over some of these peaks using using our our uh, environments here, and figure out where you're going to land when you need to when you need to land. I think that's a, a really really nice, a really good effective way of figuring that out. Um, geology, know the geology of Colorado. Why? Why are the, the valleys where they're at? Why are the mountains where they're at? And what kind of weather patterns do those facilitate or, or lack <laughs> or lack? Where, where do you want to stay away from? Where do you want to you know, plan your trips to, to stay in the lift zones uh, and, and you know, to stay out of the sink areas like uh, Avon, for example? Uh, South Park has a couple that are really, really challenging, even North Park. So all of those are fairly common, but, uh, you know, go there and fly a little bit and figure out, uh, figure out what that looks like. Um, conditioning, the sports physiology and kinesiology are really the, some of the most interesting things to me about this extreme sport. Uh, I was part of a a study back in Fort Collins in the 80s of performance, uh, uh, diet, uh, emotional, emotional um, well-being, and uh, belief systems were all included in a, a vast study that that uh, judged it, that gauged your performance based on all of those things and how and and changing the change up of all those things from a, a fat-based diet to a carbohydrate-based diet and how that affected your VO2 max. But this sport has a lot of that uh, that I've used in it. You know, how, how are you? What are you doing? Uh, can, you sit in, can you sit in a cockpit for eight hours? Uh, what's going on at home, right? And, and what do you need to do to put yourself in a better emotional space to, to take, on, take on these tasks? Uh, technology. Um, a lot of a lot's changed in the cockpit in the last uh, 10 years, 15 years. I remember having a, a Mio that was some antiquated, you know, little device that would run a map on it. But now we have, uh, you know, excellent maps. We have ADSB, we have um, Flarm, and we have uh, moving maps that are, are fabulous, and they and they definitely will help you. Figure out, you know, where you're at, what you're going, where you're going, and, and how how it will uh, hopefully it'll turn out if you can make it home. Um, your ship is really important. Um, that that to me, I, you know, I start out in the early part of the year, and and I have my setup that exact same setup that I had last year, 
and I don't change too much. I, I always say, don't change more than 5% of your ship, right? Your seat from your seat to your, your varios to your, to your maps and things like that. You want things to be fairly consistent. Um, one thing can go wrong and you're back at the airport in, in five minutes. Uh, you really wanna maintain a consistent and predictable um, elements about your ship. Um, what are your limits? What have you done you know, in your flying career? Uh, what did you do last year? And, and what, are your, what are your goals this year? Are they, are they lofty goals or are they, are they uh, in line more with you know, what, you've been, what you've been and how your progression has gone? And we'll talk a little bit about progression in a minute. Um, any guys have any questions? So we can talk a little bit about the weather. Um, everyone has a little bit different process, and uh, you know I admire I admire everyone. You know the guys that are that are really following the weather. You know setting tasks around weather, and um, you know really getting good information and comparing it to their flying style and um, learning from that and how they change their flying style, how they change their expectations. I think that's a, this is a really, really uh, important area that you can go as far as you want to. You can go as far as you want to. Um, also take a look at what's the best time of the year to do what you are attempting. You know, are you attempting something local? I mean, is it something you can do in a wave flight? Uh, or is it something that's all the way across the state or all the way south in the state that you, that you, you know, need certain weather conditions to accomplish. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice to look at other people's flights, you know, Peja and, and John and, and Bob and to see what time of the year they went, where, where they went, you know, what, what kind of tasks did they try to accomplish in July versus August, you know, versus November, <laughs> versus November. Um, speed and distance. Um, this type of flying is not necessarily a speed type of flying. Um, I, I find myself flying for altitude and for uh, to accomplish the great amount of distance at, at the highest altitude that I possibly can. So, you know, even, even flying with water is, is, I didn't do any of these peaks with water. Because invariably on, on longer flights, you can get in trouble about three or four times. I mean, get low to the point where you really want to climb fast. And water, um, I, I'd probably be dumping water in about uh, an hour or two on, on some of these flights. Um, it's definitely something to think about. Um, I highly recommend you know, trying to fly with water, but uh, it's this, this type of flying is, you're flying for safety, which is altitude. Um, uh, Tom. Yep. Yeah. Does everybody know what kind of ship you have? Uh, what what I, kind I, you have and the vintage of it, performance I, like that to, to give some um, sure, I can perspective? Answer that. I, I have an ASW twenty. It's an A. It's an A model. Uh, vintage nineteen seventy nine. And um, it has. I, I I put water in it last year, right at the end of all these all these fourteeners, uh, and. Um, have found great value in it. It's fabulous, but it also, you know, can cause problems when you're when you're low and slow and and you need to accomplish something. So, but uh, uh, it's a great ship. I, I flew quite a bit in the Discus and the DG. Um, this particular model has uh, the landing flaps that will really allow you to land slow and very short. I don't know if there's another ship that has such a thing that you know, as a fiberglass ship. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons why I, I still enjoy flying it. Uh, if I need to put it down in 300 feet or 400 feet, I know I can do that. Uh, difference in performance in your ship uh, with and without water? Um, really, it's only about, uh, you know, I, I, Last year I flew quite a bit with water and, and I think my speeds went up about 15 kilometers an hour. 
in this kind of flying, in this kind of flying. Uh, speed flying, it might go up 20 to 25, maybe if you're lucky. Um, it, it, this particular ship, its performance with, with just dry is really, really good. Really, really good. Um, it, the, the, there's a vast difference between, you know, our Discus CS in the club and, and, and the ASW 20. Uh, it's like it has another gear. Um, and, uh, you know, it's what I, it's what I immediately noticed was when, when you see a cloud that's 10 to 15 miles away, you know, you can make it there. And, um, it's, uh, uh quite a bit of difference. It's, you know, it was also good just to get out of the club, uh, club, uh, fleet just, just because of, uh, just being able to not worry about any, you know, landing out and dinging an airplane or, or anything like that it really relieved a lot of pressure. It relieved a lot of pressure. Um, so a few more things about the weather. What, what you really want to look for, uh, you know, in, in this, I'm gonna, this type of flying, which is you're what? not just going to be going north and south and north-south convergences. You're going to be going uh, east and west and following more uh, dry line convergences, um, uh, fronts and dry line convergences. It seems to be, you know, the, the interstate that, that allows you to get across the state. Um, the thermal, the thermal uh, variability is, is great. When you leave Boulder, some days there's no thermals and you'll get over into Granby uh, or in South Park and you'll have really, really good thermals. And then the next mountain range that you cross, there will be very few. So we have a lot of different zones, a lot of different areas that have different behaviors as far as the lift and the types of lift that you might get. Um, I, I say that, and, and, we'll, and we'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, I seventy isn't the only uh, highway in the sky. Uh, the only highway. There's one in the sky right over I seventy, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, hey, hey, Tom. Yep. Um, um, how many flights did it take to complete from Boulder? Uh, I'm not really sure. I, I think I think there were ten major flights that ended up the, the long flights, right? I've done I've done most of the fourteeners on shorter versions, so I probably, you know, twenty or thirty flights I've been doing, you know, fourteeners. Uh, so, but the the long flights there were there were about ten, and the most recent in two in about two or three years, um, and I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, so weather observations, I typically look three to seven days out to see what's coming and what you know the world thinks is coming to the to the weather. I look for a local uh, and and to to a regional perspective. Um, now I wake up and I look at the you know what's what what kind of weather is happening on the on the day that I'm flying, and you know you can really kind of tell just from the the uh, the local weather what if you're going to get out of Boulder or not. Um, lastly, uh, reaching outside of the models is a really important skill to have. When you have a weather model idea in your head and you have your task set, what happens when that doesn't work out? What happens? Uh, if, you're, if you're near a 14er and you know, you know that you might not make it back down there for another year or two, um, what do you do, right? Uh, how much improvising are you say are you are you uh, safe with, <laughs> right? Are you willing to ridge soar up something that is you know forty miles away from a landing area, right? Or do you just go home and and uh, try it again in two years if you can make it? Um, so there's there's a, a section here about reaching. It's somewhat of a sailboat term, but. So this is uh, typical blip maps that we use. Um, this might take a minute to come in to your computer, but I look at this to be able to see what is happening, you know, in Utah and how it's going to, you know, behave when it comes into Colorado. 
Um, this is a really good sounding. This would be a fabulous day to go flying. It's in the end of, end of uh, July. But this is something that you know, will give you an idea of the general area that you will be able to have you know, better success than some other area, right? And, um, but a very, very good sounding. We typically in Colorado in the summer have monsoon. And much of my flying the 14ers is based on the monsoon. Where is it at? Where is the moisture at? Where's the dry line going to happen? Um, and when and what kind of thermal interaction am I going to have with that dry line? Is it gonna to be too hot uh, to have the, uh, uh, the, the, the wet flow just blow up the minute it hits the, the, dry, the dry flow and the temperatures? Um, it's something that I've found that is the most reliable thing to get you across the state. Um, is just having that nice uh, wet push from the Gulf the, from, to the south, the dry push from Utah, and then uh, a high pressure push from Wyoming. And uh, ride, riding that surf is uh, a pretty successful strategy. Tom, um, could you further explain a uh, dry line? I'm not that familiar yeah. with the definition. So here is a, uh, a relative humidity um, blip map. And it isn't, I, I, I had trouble finding appropriate blip maps for you guys because there used to be a, a blip map archive and, I, and, I, and it, somebody turned it off. So um, this is the best one that I could find. And it's also, also one in the end of June. Um, but can you see my cursor on here? Yeah. Yeah, right here. Okay. So from, from, from basically Boulder moving to the west, straight west, you know, we see a general line of difference in moisture. Down south, we have 80, 70 to 80% moisture down in here. And then we have a dry line where I call it the I 70 corridor that is kind of a boundary layer in there, if, you'll, if, if, you, if you can say that. And all it has to be is 10 to 20% difference in, in, the, you know, in the model for it to be a very pro predominant line in the sky. And I'll show you some images here in a minute of what this looks like. And basically this edge here, uh, Jack, is going to be, uh, a line of clouds that's going to be denser than what's north of it, okay, in the dry side. There might not be any clouds in the dry side, okay? But this line here Perfect. is going to be the boundary of that. And um, so just, just like, uh, I mean, I, you, you basically will, will, will follow that line as far as it will go. And it's generally pretty consistent because those types of, of, of uh, I call them convergences, they don't change really fast. They're not fast moving in the summer, right? So it'll sit there all day long and you can play with it. You can play with the edge of it. You can play with uh, flying into the wet line and you can play with what happens on, on say, you know, the, in the dry area, in the dry line of that, just depending on what time of the time of the day that you're flying it. And I'll, show, Tom, I'll show you that in a minute. What's the difference in cloud base between the dry and the wet side? Well, it really, it really depends on the temperature of the air, of course. Um, but what I notice is the cloud base doesn't change that much, just the preponderance of the clouds do, right? It's, you know, uh, it builds up real fast in the wet line and, and, it, and, it, and it can cycle, right? Um, it can be a situation where it's not super saturated that it just rains. It's that it will rain and it will, it will stop and it will uh, cycle. So the cycling of in, in the wet is quite often generally, but it's also really, really good flying. It is, it is you know, not something that, uh, 
you know, the beginner pilots are going to want to get into too much, but, you know, if the lift is good, let's go there. Right. And what are you seeing from the cockpit that allows you to stay in that line and not deviating from it? Let me show you, let me show you real quick here. We're going to, we're going to switch our modes here a little bit. Um, So I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up to this right here. So this is looking um, northeast from Aspen, okay? And basically, you know, I-70 is about 40 miles north of here, but you can see the line out to my right that definitely has more um, moisture in it and out to my left, less moisture and straight above, nothing. Right. And so this line, if you can get to it, you know, without any indicators or you can get away from it without any indicators and get into another lift area, that's a really successful strategy. Right? You know, there's always lift over here, always. Right. And in the blue, we all know about blue flying. It can be kind of hit or miss, but in the deep summer like this, you have a lot more, you have a lot more chance of finding a blue thermal somewhere. Let me do a little video action here, just as, a, just as an example. Um, and I'll stop this and make comments. So this is the Aspen chain by, by uh, from basically Lake Lake City um, to to Aspen. Well, here we go. We're gonna get over to Aspen here. That's Aspen that way. We got Castle Peak. We have uh, Pyramid Peak, and then you can see Broom Bells there, and then Snowmass up north there a little bit. But. Not a lot of time to dally here. Looks like it's going to shut down, so we're going to get in and out. Okay, so you can see from this that everything to my left is cycling, and everything to the right is forming, but it's not ODing. That's a very, very common dry dry line in that area, and these uh, can be found all the way up to I seventy you know, all over the state. But this one in particular is um, super, super wet off to the left and drier on the right. And you're following basically just along the boundary. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, wherever it's not dropping out. I mean, you know, I'm going to yeah. go right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go right up to this cloud next, right? And see and see what happens. So let's just forward through the video here a little bit. Uh, we are currently 103 miles away from Boulder. We're gonna try and get them from Boulder and get back to Boulder tonight. So that's what we're doing. And I'll talk to you in a minute when we get to Castle Peak. Okay, so that's gonna... So now we're about another 25 to 30 miles ahead. And you can see how the weather has changed quickly. Castle Peak, right here. This is the Aspen chain. This is all the 14ers around Aspen. So now we're flying in the blue. Castle Peak. What month was this flight? Right there. Nice lift above it. And there's great lift in the blue. So we're gonna zoom ahead here a little bit to all the way past Aspen. So you can look back at what's going on. Tom, someone asked which month this was in. This was in, I believe July, if I'm not mistaken. So this is right on basically Snowmass area, Snowmass Mountains capital. I'm a gentle lift here. 
like to be at 25,000. Okay, so you can see where we came from basically straight off the nose. And uh, off to our right is, uh, is you know, the, wet, the wetter area of the sky. That is Crested Butte, just off the wing, uh, off in the distance, about 30, 30, 30 miles. And the next series of, of video will uh, basically I leave from here and then I pick back up the video when I'm over the top of, uh, of uh, Crested Butte. But notice how fast it changes. Super dry off towards that's that direction is is basically uh, uh, Paonia and marble, and then that direction is basically the desert. That's Moab over the horizon there. So I'm going to fast forward this a little bit until we get over over to here's Crested Butte. And this is just the distance between, you know, this is just the difference between where, sorry about that. It might have been 30 minutes, maybe 20 minutes or something like that. Okay, so that direction is due south. The, the monsoonal flow is pushing up from the southeast part of the state. And we have another dry line here that, that is another, in my opinion, an infamous dry line because the desert air hits that monsoon flow and you have a, another interstate in, the high, interstate in the sky that'll go all the way to Telluride. And it's about to OD, you know, right in front of us. So another, another two or three minutes and this whole thing is gonna cycle. And Bob Ferris and I are flying out there that day and we're, and we're flying, he's flying in it, I'm flying around it. But it cycles and it's, and it's a successful day because you, know, you always have a cycle effect. It's not enough moisture and not enough heat to make it rain all day long. How do you judge that? Is that you just look at the vertical development of the clouds or how do you judge whether it's going to cycle or it's just going to OD and go, go nuts? Well, if, if I go back here, if I go forward just a little bit here, in this area, I can see that the towering development isn't happening. Okay. There isn't vertical development in these clouds. There's none anywhere around here. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's see, you just look at vertical development. Yeah. Yeah, vertical development and and uh, density, like you know, like this area over here. No, I wouldn't want to fly there, right? But if you stay in, you know, where there is some blue and some sun on the ground, there's going to be vertical, you know, lift in there. If I go over here, you might find some in 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 the Virga, but you know, also might get, you know, slammed to the ground too. So I tend to go around it and try to stay in the sun. See this whole area on, on the ground here? Basically, if you fly right around that and go this direction, Bob kind of went underneath it, you know, here, but I like to kind of stay on the edge. There just seems to be a better lift there and I feel safer about it, feel safer about it. Um, this video goes, Basically, we're going around this area, do a few circles, but we go around it. And then we, then we get into regular, you know, nice cloud flying again, south of it. Fairly, it's, it's fairly um, localized right over, right over uh, the ski area there. Okay, now this is probably another 50 miles south there 
down towards um, San Luis Peak on the same flight. But still looking really good. There's a little bit of moisture in the air and it is back. But we'll get down here over the peak and I'll turn, I'll turn around and you can see what the weather looks like when, when the turn is made. So this is San Luis Peak. And I turn back around. Okay, see that dry line here that we came down? All the way from um, Crested Butte. Okay, now that's the view towards Boulder. Um, on this day, I did not plan to come back to Boulder. I was going to land in uh, Salida and uh, had no intention of going back to Boulder. But this, this, this type of flying down there, you know, will get you back to Salida. Get you back to Salida. Um, but I always just kind of choose the, the edge of all of, the, all of the, uh, the clouds that are upwind. Right, not the downwind side here, the upwind side to make to make uh, to make miles. Um, I tend not to go directly under the darkest part of the cloud. I, I try to stay in somewhere that there's a there's a, a variation of the sun and, and the cloud cover. And it generally works pretty good. So Tom, um, was the wind predominantly west northwest on this day? Say that again. Was the wind predominantly west northwest on this day, and was um, it fairly consistent? It was fairly consistent since it, since it's uh, since it was such a north south route, it did change. But I think this time of the year you don't typically see a, a huge change in it. It might have changed by ten knots or so. Um, part of part of the, the success of getting across the state to the 14ers is the ability to get a tailwind on the way back because you spend almost all your day to get out there. And what you really need is you need a, a quartering tailwind or a 90 degree wind. So, so you're not pushing a wind of any kind. Um, up in the Vale area, that, that, that place on, on Snowmass Peak is kind of what I call the, 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 the starting pad for going home because you can pick a line from from Snowmass Peak to Avon to Vail to Kremlin, and you typically have a 20 knot tailwind most of the year, and it really gets it really gets you back across the state. Um, I look for that every every time I fly. What is what what kind of uh, wind differential am I going to have on my way out versus on my way back? And if you get out early in the morning, the winds generally generally are less. So once you get across the state, the winds pick up, maybe the last, you know, 20 to 50 miles, you're pushing 20 to 25 knots to get out to somewhere. But the minute you turn around, you know, the benefits are, are, are gonna get you home. Right? And so that is something I look for all the time. What are the winds doing? When are they gonna do it? What do you use to forecast uh, the, the wind velocity differential throughout the day? Uh, you know, when you're looking at models? Uh, the blip maps work pretty good for me. I'll, I'll probably go into SkySight next. I'd like the granularity, right? Um, but, I'll, but I'll also look at what the winds are doing in Utah. Uh, I have a nephew in Utah in Moab and, you know, I, I use their weather models to say, okay, or Grand Junction is, is kind of what we were taught, you know, in the system. Look at Grand Junction because that air is going to come to Boulder. Um, you know, there's low level air, there's low level winds and there's upper level winds. What are the upper levels doing, right? Um, it might be direct west uh, on the ground, but upper levels are going to possibly change that in a day. Um, it can, it can uh, drop down and get you a lot, a lot more tailwind or a lot more headwind. And um, um, 
look, look at all those different types of things so you can get a, a general uh, idea of, oh, I'm gonna push a 20, I'm gonna push a 20 knot headwind out and I'm gonna get a 25 knot headwind benefit on the way back. Uh, this day, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned you, you wanna fly on the upwind side of the dry line. Isn't, aren't you facing, aren't you pointing north here? Yes, I am. Uh, well, then wouldn't the right side be the downwind? It is. So I fly, I fly upwind all the time. Never fly downwind. So this is the upwind if, if we have a west I wind here. Yeah. I, okay, I got you. Rather than the other side of the loops. Right. All right. This, this cloud bank, you'd be on the downwind side of that cloud bank. Right? Thank so you. you. Now, now so I get it. So you'd push back over to the front side if you're trying to get, you know, some, some distance. So, but, so this flight actually ended up flying, ended up land, um, ending in Boulder. I, I was very, very surprised. Once I got to South Park, it was actually very similar weather all the way to Boulder and it, uh, it worked. And I had no plan for that. No plan for that. Um, well, let's see where we're at in the... So here's, here's another one that we'll, we'll look at, and it's, I call it flying into the wet line. It's basically of Sneffels Peak down by Telluride. Uh, it, uh, the, the, this, was, this was the general cloud base when I flew my first peaks down there. I mean, it was literally flying at 14 to 15,000 feet all day long. And uh, it gives you a really nice view but, but I came from a, a, an area of nicer weather and flew into this monsoonal flow. And I found that there was just uh, an immense amount of lift. So I flew, I flew most of the 14ers that day, but it was, you know, flying at 14, 14, five, somewhere around there all day. Um, yeah, that looks pretty scary <laughs> though. <laughs> Tom, did you generally have an airfield that you could always glide to for the most part? Or were you looking for possible land out areas if you ever got low? Of course. Yeah. Um, the, the process for the for those 14ers down in the San Juans, and you know, hopefully Colin can chime in on his flight here in a minute, um, is that you really want to try and get there as high as you can, but you know I've rarely been at 17.5 there. There just there just doesn't seem to be, you know, a super consistent, you know, altitude like that. So you're always looking for for places to land. I could have got Montrose from here, um, maybe even Crawford. I think I think I calculated that you could almost get to Crawford from here, uh, as long as you got over the Black Canyon. <laughs> but I find that that Google you know, uh, Earth is invaluable for this type of flying. Um, you can you can look at a, a field on it. You can identify a field, and someday when you're down there on vacation, you can stop and walk the field. Mm -hmm. And I, I did that. Um, I specifically, went south of Telluride down to you know Durango, and you know went down the valleys and said, "Oh, wow, this looks great. This looks fabulous." Um, there are some areas, though, that if you get caught, you're not going to find a place to land until you get to uh, um, get, get out to an airport. That's just the way it is. So everyone has to gauge, you know, their tolerance to that. And uh, but this is a fun. This is a fun. This is a fun. This is a fun peak because it was just there were people on it. And, Going around it, you can kind of get an idea of the nice contrast that you find when there are clouds like this. And it's very, very rare to get this close to a 14er. Because you really don't want to get, really don't want to get that close to a 14er. Um, that's straight ahead, right over that, right over that um, 
ridge there is Telluride, but a super beautiful area to fly. Yeah, we can't see the video, Tom, if you're running the video. And I think I flew around there for, you know, one. that was one day where that's as far as I could really make it from Crawford. But <clears throat> it was super fun because I went up and ridge soared all the, uh, uh, the ridges above Telluride and, and made it home. It was really, really great. Uh, Tom, we couldn't see the video. We just saw the, the still image. See? Oh, you did? You didn't see the video? No. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I think we're just running, running our, our space over. But yeah. OK. So that gives you somewhat of an idea of what you might have to do to get a peak. You might have to you know, push your limits. Uh, you know, you might have to uh, accept that you may not make it back to where you took off from <laughs> or, or make it home. Um, that's just, uh, it's a mindset that I, that I accepted uh, a, lot, a lot of the time for this long, these long flights. Um, hey, Tom, we have three of the four uh, people that have accomplished this task here. I wonder if there's a consensus among you three which were the hardest ones to, to reach? Yeah, I'll let everybody else chime in on that. Uh, Colin here, firstly, what Tom, Tom's, Tom's indicating, I, I'm in 100% agreement. Many of these flights, I was saying that I was prepared to land at an airport, which was not my origin that I would uh, just accept bagging the peaks and then not getting, not getting home, but landing safely. The final set, which was, uh, I think, the most difficult, are the ones around Telluride. And there, the, I sort of scoped it out using Google Earth that there was a landable uh, center pivot field to the, on the way to, uh, we've got, on the way to Gunnison, and the day before I made my flight, which completed the 14, is I actually went out and did a drive-by on that field. So I was, even though it was kind of, I was very confident that I would always be safe in, in that port, you know, and because of the planning I did. And, uh, but those ones around uh, Telluride, uh, you know, uh, they're kind of remote. <laughs> so. Yeah, so um, Bob, are you on, on? You want to chime in on that, or are you? Gibson's here. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, when I did the ones around Taylor, right? Actually, I did it out of Durango um, when that was Bel Air was still open, and uh, Telluride was actually closed because they were redoing the runway, so. That wasn't an option to land and it, it's kind of spooky you had to stay really high over all those peaks and kind of did that loop but uh, that was probably like colin said probably the most difficult uh, and remote peaks to to bag back through there especially the ones around silverton um yeah you just got to stay high there because there's very few places to land yeah yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would vote that too. I wish, I wish that Durango would have been open. Um, Crawford is really good though. If 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 you can get a tow plane out at Crawford, um, it's pretty easy terrain up up until Telluride, and um, it's, uh, it's it's a really really nice little airport. Um, but I would mimic that these fourteeners are probably the most difficult that I ever flew. Um, I, you know, it's, it's really hard to do all these on one flight. I, 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 it'd be really, really difficult um, unless you could fly at 17,000 all day long, which would be really fabulous. Um, but uh, I, I think it's, these are by far the most, uh, Calibra was somewhat difficult, but it was all front range flying and, you know, there's places to land there. Um, typically. Okay, hey, Tom. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm not very good at this. So taking a 25,000 foot view of this, um, 
Could you comment on, I guess, two things. One, what do you think might have been your biggest regret in tactically or strategically uh, speaking in ac accomplishing this? And on the other opposite side, what was the smartest thing you did? Hmm. Uh, the smartest thing I did was figured out the wet dry lines that, that interact with the dry air coming off the desert, right? If you got a push coming up from the Gulf and it's not super, super wet and you have a push coming from, you know, Utah, um, it's dry air, uh, that's going to interact somewhere. And what are the possibilities around that? Um, I guess the biggest regret was that I didn't get better video of all these. <laughs> but, you know, video is, uh, is something that will kill you. And um, the damn cameras don't work half the time anyway. Um, but it's, uh, it's nice to document it a little bit for other people and yourself, because it's a, a pretty rare thing to be involved in. Um, it's sort of a solitary sport. I mean, Bob and I were flying down by, down by uh, you know, uh, Aspen. And it's just fun to have somebody around, right, when you're doing this. But um, any of these long flights down here, there was nobody around. Everybody was flying around on the front range, <laughs> you know. They're, they're staying close to home, but um, it's really, really nice to have at least somebody around that's in radio contact. So if you have a buddy system, that'd be great. That, that would be a really good thing to do, you know. Um, really good thing to do. So this uh, image that is up here, let's just go to a 2D, 2D version of it, kind of gives you an idea of how the tracks paint on the uh, geology and, and the geography of Colorado, right? And I think that if we all put our flights on there, I think it'd paint the whole darn place, but these tracks are um, kind of the highways in the sky. Basically, they're over the high country, the highest of the peaks. That's where the best lift is. That's where the best areas to fly are. Um, Gunnison Valley is not. <laughs> um, South Park a little bit is not. But, and, and say, you know, the Wet Valley is, I've had bad luck there. But you can kind of take a look at other people's flights. If you're gonna do one of these flights, even if, you know, to the crust stones, you can kind of see, well, you know, you're gonna follow certain paths and um, you can avoid certain areas. Never want to get down, never want to get downwind of the big mountains, right? Ever. And, you know, we all, we all kind of tend to cross over Texas Creek coming from Woodland, Woodland Park or, or uh, you know, in that area. Um, I remember calling Charlie on, on, the, on the needle one day. He was down there. I was staying at my house down there and Charlie was flying by and I had my radio. <laughs> And I could tell the excitement in his voice. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was good to talk to him that day. But um, yeah, when you're doing these, you're a long way away from home and typically a long way away from friends. So um, the, solitary, the solitary confinement of the cockpit can be overwhelming at some, sometimes. But this gives you an idea of kind of just the pathways. Of what it looks like. What it looks like. Um, let me see. I'll go to another thing here where what I have outlined here in red are basically the, the concentrations of the peaks and the pathways. You can you can just compare. Um, these are the pathways like this. And from Salida, you get over to Silverton, you get over to Telluride, you know, back if you're going to Salida, right? Or I, or I always try to get back to Aspen um, 
it seems to be a good launch point is Aspen. But this kind of gives you an idea of where you're going to need to fly from or uh, where you're going to need to pass by most efficiently. Um, front range is also really, really good too down here. But I think, I think it's just really important to get your own algorithm. You know, go fly these, you know, however you can. You can fly them in a power, you can fly them in a power airplane just to kind of get the orientation and get, get it in your head about where you're at and where you're going and where you don't want to be. All right, let's go back to the. Okay. So lastly, one of the last things we're going to talk about is conditioning. Um, this is initially for you new pilots. So how do we get from the, 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 the 150K bucket to the 300K bucket to the 800K plus bucket. And uh, all I can say is let's, let's do it carefully. Um, I know how I did it was I had this competitive nature with my instructor and I did everything I could to stay in the air longer than he did. And it was painful. And I just sort of carried that through my flying. I said, okay, if you can stay in the air six to eight hours every day that you fly, you're going to gain the conditioning for long distance flight. And eventually it happened, but it started by flying the 134 for five hours, you know, locally and just staying in the air as, as long as you possibly can. Um, then you can expand that out when you feel more and more comfortable. You know, go do Grays and Tories versus you know Longs Peak. Um, uh, get down into Leadville and then come home. Uh, take baby steps. Uh, this is not something to mess with. And uh, I flew down to Leadville with uh, Alistair one day, and it was really, really a good learning experience for both of us. Um, just you know, being patient and helping other people figure out where the lift is when they've never been down there or even, you know, where their next thermal might be. Um, I, I wish that we could have more of that type of mentorship. Uh, we would all progress a lot quicker. But I had excellent mentors in Bob and Al and Colin and uh, other people that uh, took me out and showed me the ropes. And I think we need to do that uh, for other people. Other people. Um, other types of conditioning, you know, some people are still still in pretty good shape in our old age. I'm, I'm losing it, but uh, I spend more time on yoga and, and meditation. Uh, it just kind of allows me to, you know, be calm and sit in one spot for, for a long period of time with, you know, a relatively high workload on your brain. Um, And moving down to external factors. What's going on in the world? What's going on in your life? You know, are you in a spot? Are you in a space of being able to make challenges and, 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 and take, take a look at new goals and, and be strategic and accomplish things? Is that, what, is that what's going on in your life? If it's not, then stay local. You really need to be, uh, you know, in a healthy mind and uh, in place in your mind to do this stuff. Uh, panic. Go ahead. Um, yeah, at some point, could you fit in um, the difference in what you can accomplish if you're planning all of your landouts to be just at airports versus um, allowing yourself to end up in a field somewhere? Um, you know, if if you, you can do airports plus fields you're going to be able to accomplish more. Um, but how much more compared to just saying, I want the convenience of uh, being able to get a tow plane and come and get me rather than inconvenience people to come drive five hours to find me. Right. 
Well, from my own experience, I think it was, you know, I would say that 75 to 85% of this you can do from an airport. Definitely can do all the collegians. You can do all, anything around Leadville and make it back to an airport, except for, except for uh, Holy Cross. But most of these, you can, you can glide out to an airport from these. And uh, I recommend people doing that, right? Always plan to land at an airport. It's really, really nice to have somebody come and get you. But Tom, um, another way to ask that question is how many times did you actually land out? Um, in my career, five. And on these flights, none. Yeah. I didn't land out, I believe, on any of them. I landed out on stuff that I was getting, oh. stu getting stupid with. Grand Lake doesn't count. No, I didn't hit any 14ers on that day. Mm. <laughs> no, no, but no, it, you know, I, I was very lucky and fairly careful, but um, fairly lucky too. Um, there were, there were times down in Telluride and I said, well, I'm going to go land. It's uh, at this reservoir north of, uh, north of uh, Durango if I, you know, can't get out of here. Right. And, uh, I'll have a question to Colin about that in about five minutes <laughs> in his last flight. So, but if that, I hope that answers your question. You, you can do a lot of these and fly right to an airport. Even from Aspen, Aspen is a very safe place to fly. I don't know what they charge you to land a glider there, but um, Trusted Butte has a, has a good airport too. You know, a place you can land, place you can land. That's a very long, uh, that's, a, that's a very long retrieve though. But all you guys have engines now, so you're not going to have to worry about that. Well, let me ask a question about that. So technically, you could bag uh, two or three peaks in a day and then land out at some airport and get towed back, and you've got those peaks. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So if in a motor glider, if you got those peaks and you were on your way back, didn't make it back, and you started your engine, do they still count? Well, I'll let Colin answer that, but I, I don't think- uh, The answer is yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it may seem like motors make this easy, but they, they do not. No. Uh, you are flying in pretty wild country, and if you need to start your motor to get to somewhere, you've already, you're already making bad choices because you <laughs> got in a position where you- you're relying on a piece of, uh, you know, unreliable hardware to get you home. Yeah. Yeah. It might make the retrieve better if you land in an airport. But. Yeah, the, the retrieves are easier, but you, yeah, you want to land at an airport. But. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's really stressful to land out. I mean, I, you know, the few times that I've landed out, it's, it's you know, it's formidable. It's a formative experience. It's not something that, uh, you know, but I also, you know, have experience, you know, from the climbing world where in the beginning part of the season, we would go out and do leader falls for one day. In other words, you do 20 leader falls from two feet to, to 40 feet. And by the end of that task, you really aren't concerned about it. It's not even in your mind. It's like, oh, well, whatever I can fall. It's not a big deal. This is very similar. I, I, I always encourage people to land out, you know, first part of the season somewhere, even if it's at Lemons, you know, it's, it's tremendously valuable to go, yeah, I know that my, my accuracy is, is uh, what it is or needs to be improved and, and that you know that you can do it. It's very, very important. Otherwise, it's all new and you, you can't use your altimeter and uh, it's, it's stressful. It's stressful, but we have we have the ability to to uh, you know land out within two miles of Boulder. Well, we should really do it. It's a it's a very very good thing. Thomas, I have a question. If you have, if I could, can you give us some? Can you give me at least some idea of the scale of experience that you amassed prior to taking on some of these challenges. Um, is this? you know, as compared to like a skier skiing greens and you're doing triple diamonds, uh, <laughs> is it, uh, something that, 
despite the fact that I have a lot of time in airplanes, I only have 12 hours in gliders. Is this something that I should be looking at years down the road or decades? Well, good question. You know, the cool thing about this is, you know, your first year, you, you may be able to, you know, get over and get long speed, right? And that's the nice thing about it. You know, we have people that have just, just started this and, you know, they're out flying Mount Evans and Grays and Tories and, and, you know, the parameters for you to do that, you know, there's so much bandwidth in a glider that you, you could never do it in a, in a regular airplane, you know, but, you know, there, the bandwidth is, is very vast. And on the other hand, I think this wasn't something I really thought about until about halfway through my flying career. I, you know, initially, I was like, forget it. I'm not, I don't care about that at all, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, those things are, you know, way, way over the top and way remote and way uh, difficult. Um, and we're going to talk about that next a little bit about you know, how to move yourself in that direction, right? Uh, in your flying. So that's, that's kind of next. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean Terry, Terry, to answer your question from my perspective, I mean, I, I started four years ago, basically pretty much from scratch. I mean, I had earlier flight experience, but not that much. And uh, I've, in, in the meantime, I've got about 500 hours and I've got about two thirds of the 14ers. So, but it's a, it's like every season you can step out a little bit, start with the ones that are local in glide range. The next year you go maybe to the mosquito range and then the next year you can start to push it a little further, but you have to fly a lot. You, you, you have to fly a lot, spend a lot of time in, air, in, in gliders. Uh, if you don't fly a lot, it's not going to happen. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I think that, I think the, a good number for me always has been 20 flights a year. To, to be, you know, progressing through something. And, you know, I don't think I, I, I call, what, what I call, I get current until about, you know, five flights in or three or three to five flights in. You just don't feel comfortable, right? And your, and your, um, your stamina also. You can't just jump in a glider and go fly six hours. Um, it'd be pretty tough. It's, it's a lot of information but you can definitely work your way up to that pretty quick, but. Yeah, in the good old days, uh, we had Dalhart and fields and airports every 15 miles and all the cornfields you could ever hope to land in or near. Uh, some people should, in general, I think, because I've scoped it out in the power plane, a couple of day camps out of Akron. And if you look at a hemisphere to the east, north, east and south, it looks a lot like Dalhart. It's a hell of a lot closer, but it's got a beautiful runway, uh, lots of option for rope breaks around the airport. I'm not sure about what they've got for camping or motels, maybe Sterling, but, uh, you know, take a bite at a little apple before you take a bite at 14,000 foot peaks. And I don't think Boulder necessarily offers a whole hell of a lot of out landing experience either, other than another airport. And, uh, there is something about sticking it in a field and rolling out 300 feet and say, Jesus, it really worked. Yeah, that's really important. And I, and I wish more people would do it. Um, you know, I, I missed the 134 because that's the perfect land out ship locally. It really is. Um, terminal die breaks and, and uh, a skid. But uh, I, I, it'd be horrible to break a discus, but I think uh, anybody that's flying a discus wouldn't break it. So you know, I highly recommend it. And, and, you know, make it a club day. We'll come get you. you know, it's a really nice thing. So the next thing that I'll talk about. If and I can you chime in from. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, yeah, Mark uh, uh, Terry is going to uh, host a land out seminar. Uh, He's going to talk about. He's going to use this ground school, and he's going to talk about landouts and retrieves. And then we're going early in the spring. We are going to do a club landout where we'll put a tow plane at another airport, um, you know, maybe um, Longmont or uh, Erie, and we'll let people 
fly to an airport they haven't been to, land out, and tow them back and give them a tow out. So that is in the works, Tom. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Longmont's good too. I mean, I've used Longmont a couple times when you know it's blowing 50 knots across in Boulder. It's like just go to Longmont. I mean, it's just right there, and it'll save your it'll save your airplane. And um, feel free to do that or go find a field. That's what I you know. It's better to land uh, you know in a field that you're comfortable with you know with a 50 knot headwind than it is to try and land crosswind. That, that is a great idea. If you go to flying in Tucson, they actually, the Tucson club at Altero X or south of Altero actually has a pricing sheet for arrow retrieves by the airport you land at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's cool. That's great. That's great. Well, I wish that we would do it more because I, I think, you know, there's there's just a lot more flying that we we could be doing. Um, you know, I landed out in in Silver Heels last for the first time last uh, camp, and uh, two or three years before that, I landed three or four miles to the north in some in 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 a farmer's field, and it's it's nice to be able to comfortably decide that well, I'm going to land out here and I'm not going to get stressed about it. You know, take your time, take your time, pick a good field, you know, and call your, call your, your buddy. So the next, next thing I want to get into is a little bit more esoteric. And this is a little bit more um, about emotions and about how well we operate under stress. Um, you can kind of see this. This is a graphic that I've always liked. It's uh Talks, talks a little bit about when you're in the state of uh, real comfortable uh, stress or no stress, lack of stress, and you know what, what can happen when you get outside of it. You know, if we get too high of a difficulty for a low skill, we're going to be we're going to have we're going to have stress. And then if we're on final glide from uh, Pikes Peak and there's no, there's, it's late in the day and you're hungry and you're bored, you fall asleep. <laughs> you know, you, you, we really need to stay in the range here of, of an effective skill set, an effective decision making process, and, uh, you know, to help us move through learning and move through and into high performance. Of, of our of ourselves, right? Um, three things. The uh, first three things are really basic. You need real clear goals that you're trying to attain. You need to be able to concentrate and have total focus. Um, and need need that balance between the skills and the challenge. Um, fourth thing is you know you need to be able to have control of yourself. This is not the domination type of control, but you know, are you in control of your mind? Are you in control of your emotions, right? What happens when you get stressed out? Do you know what happens when you get stressed out, right? Are you uh, a, a, perform a, a high performer in stress or are you a low performer in stress? Um, this is one of the things that we did at the sports physio lab, physiology lab in, in, uh, in uh, Fort Collins was, you know, what happens when you get under stress and you have anxiety? Uh, what happens to your visual field? What happens to your heart rate? What happens to your, uh, you know, your, your motor skills, right? Some people had higher, higher performance when they were stressed and some people had lower performance when they stressed to, to a, a vast degree, right? Um, if somebody was under what they would classify as a 50% stress test. Um, some people would, you know, roll up in a ball after being submerged in water versus, you know, some people can hold their breath for, for, you know, three or four minutes that way. And, or, you know, attain tremendous aerobic activities under stress, fight or flight. Using that to your advantage. I think it's really important for people to you know, understand that for themselves so they can go, well, I'm actually just one step beyond my comfort level here. 
and I might be okay, or it's time to go home. It's time to do something different, right? Super, super important. Um, this is, uh, I've drawn on this three areas that I think are, are, are pertinent here. Um, this area number three is I think where we learn the best is right on, right on the edge of anxiety, uh, fear, or that you might fail, right? And that's a, a really nice long line here. <laughs> uh, it, it allows you to get a little bit outside of your comfort level, but then immediately step back in the flow of things. Uh, as we move up, uh, this area here, number two, is I think where uh, people on Mount Everest are, some of the solo sailors in the world, uh, pilots, uh, sailplane pilots doing really unusual things. Uh, you're, you're always in this area of uh, heightened anxiety and not necessarily fear, but you're just in a zone of, of right on the edge. You're right on the razor's edge. That's what I would call this. Um, one is a safe zone, but you know, in, in sailplanes that changes every five minutes. It's just this sort of, you know, navigation of this particular area in a sailplane, in my opinion, no matter where you're at on this, no matter where you're at on this. Um, <clears throat> so figuring that out for yourself is really, really important. So now we're going to get down to the brass tacks of your airplane. Um, you really want to be able to have every, everything set up as best you can. You want to have your seat set up so you can sit in it for eight hours. You want to have eight to 16 hours worth of food for land outs, uh, water for 24, uh, urine management. You know, does, are you, are you relying on it going overboard or are you holding it on, you know, in the, uh, in the cockpit somehow? That's probably one of the most important things that will ruin a flight if it doesn't work properly. Um, I keep everything, I keep two, three, three liter bags inside the airplane because I don't want it going overboard. Uh, if you have a pea system that goes overboard, it will freeze, I guarantee it, and you'll have a big mess. Um, it's just never been able to get it to work consistently. You'll always forget to clean out the tube and then you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, emergencies, uh, everybody needs to have a spot and have it on all the time. Have it on all the time. Sometimes people don't fly in the winter, but even the winter is important. We've had accidents and we really want to know where people are at, even in wave. Even in wave. Uh, typical sunstroke, you know, are you sensitive or not? I'm one of those people that is super sensitive to sunstroke. So I got to be hydrated and I have to, you know, know where my, my hydration is at in my entire body and know when I've, you know, had too much heat. Um, I've landed and not been able to walk out of the cockpit once or twice because I had some inner ear uh, anomaly. And I would have never known it if I, you know, didn't get out of the cockpit. But, you know, something, sometimes things can happen like that. And uh, it was okay after a day or so. Luckily, Charlie was on site. Um, noise, you know, do you need, do you need earplugs? You know, are you gonna have headphones, et cetera? Um, I'm really sensitive to noise. I need to have headphones. Batteries, they better, they better last. They can't be the club batteries that last three hours. Um, that's not good for anybody. You need to be able to hear your radio and, uh, you know, see your farm and, and um, have your varial work. That's, that helps out on those long days. Uh, outdoor gear, I, I take a four season tent with a sleeping bag and uh, down pants and a down jacket. I think I landed out in, in, uh, in Jefferson one time and it was, I think, September, I think. And if my partner wasn't you know, four or five hours behind me, I would have been very uncomfortable. Uh, it's very cold at night at 10,000 feet. Um, 
wing loading, we've already talked about water. <clears throat> um, but you want to be able to survive for 24 to 36 hours at 10,000 feet. That's just the worst case scenario that you could that you can really get uh, other than crashing, but you really want to be able to have that time frame and be able to get a hold of people. Um, cockpit, uh, what's going on in the inside? You know, you want you want a couple different uh, versions of maps. You want to have uh, you know at least two separate uh, digital maps. Sectionals are great. Uh, for flight of Avair, whatever you have. Um, use, use your cock, use your AWOS resources. Um, call up, you know, what's going on, what's going on on Berthoud Pass when you're, when you're 50 miles out? What's going on in Leadville? You know, what's going on in Aspen? You really want to use that. That is tremendously beneficial. Um, use it. You got plenty of time up there. So, um, Vario setup. I have one Vario set with basically no compensation. And another Vario set for, I don't know, 20 or 30%. So two or three second delay. Um, but when I'm, when I'm really low and desperate, I have a Vario I turn on and there's no, there's no uh, delay in it. So you'll have every little puff of air available to the Vario and you know, to, for you to find, to, to find lift that you normally might not find with something that you have it damped down a little bit. Um, McCready flight. We, sort of talked about that, but um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a block flyer. I learned that from Bob, you know, if it's 70 mile an hour day or a 60 mile an hour day or an 80 mile an hour day, that's kind of how I fly. And McCready has helped me fly a little faster with water. I think that's, that's, that was the biggest advantage. Um, it's a great concept, but for this kind of flying, uh, it's great for a final glides maybe. And uh, for determining whether you're going to make it somewhere, it's, it's fabulous. But for the peaks, I don't really use it. I'm flying for altitude. Um, keep your eyes peeled. You want to have all, everything available to you. Look at ground references. Look at the lakes. Look at the sky. Look at the shading. Look at the geography or the geology of what, where you're flying over. You know, I got really low one place and I, and, I, and I didn't realize why this ridge worked, but it did and I'm glad to be home. But then I, I discovered why it was working was because sun was on one side and shade was on the other. And there were no clouds above it, but you know, I, I got enough altitude to make it home. So those things work really, really well and um, use them, you'll need that. So before we get to the awards ceremony, anybody have any questions? Did you take any golf club clubs with you on some of your flights? No, oh, you know, I wish I had, but I didn't, I didn't end up needing them. <laughs> I knew Caldwell had his, so I was following him. <laughs> No. Tom, on any of these flights, did you ever really scare yourself? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you right, tell you right, it's pretty frightening. Hmm. But you know, where else? Tell you right was probably the one that yeah. was, you know, I, I got low right outside of Mount Aeolus, and we'll we'll go over that real quick here with Collins flight. And uh you know, when you've never been there before and you don't exactly know where you're at, you know, the map might tell you something, but, you know, it might not be, you know, familiar to you. Um, things can get, things can get kind of weird, but I enjoy that. So, so that's all I have for you. I just wanted, there's just one other, one other thing that I wanted to formally award Colin his uh, 14 er challenge award since we did not have any uh, festivities last year. Um, he, he, uh, he very efficiently, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at his flight here, um, completed his task out of Salida. Two years ago, is that what it was? Yeah, about a year and a half, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, let me try and get back in here. We'll go over that real quick here, hold on. 
but a, a, a big congratulations to him doing that. That was, uh, I was there when he finished and um, there's something about flying that has always, has always intrigued me and always interested me. And it was, it's, it's that point when someone does a solo flight and they come back from the solo flight and, and they're just alive. Their eyes are bright, they're smiling, they are in a different, a different state of being. And when Colin finished that from Salida, I was there when he landed and I saw that. I saw that, you know, 10 or 12 year old kid that, that made the jump. He made the, the, you know, something that somebody told him that he couldn't do. And to me, that is what flying is about. It's about realizing those kinds of goals and, and realizing that very difficult things. And let's, let's just go over your flight here, Colin. I just, I just want you to explain a couple things to me. Oh, <laughs> um, we'll turn this one on and we'll turn the rest of them off. Colin, did you uh, did you do all of these in your discus too? Correct. No motors, even though I get one. <laughs> were, were you flying with water? Uh, no, Tom's right. It, it's not a question of speed; it's a question of height. And the day I did, I I read the weather. I, had a, I went to Salida deliberately to pick up these fourteeners. I'll be doing that for a couple of years, and like, this is a, this is like a not a trivial goal. It's a goal that requires planning over time, and uh, I sort of really researched how to get into these areas. And you know, as Tom alluded, the the first thirty of the fourteeners are fantastic because. You kind of everybody. It's like baseball, you know. Practice. Everybody gets a prize. You know the the you know the along the uh, collegiate peaks and down the down the uh, Sangria de Cristos. You're just knocking off fourteeners left, right, and center. But the last few, which is a great thing I feel about this challenge, uh, is that it really makes you focus on a uh, on a goal. And makes you plan everything, every little, every little thing you can do will make it. Will make this these last, uh, I think, nine that I did was successful. I had maps in my cockpit because one of the things that they, all these fourteeners are just coming up left, right, and center really quickly. And I had a I had a map in you know in my cockpit just of the relationships of the fourteeners, so I could just drive through them, but. Uh, I got out of Salida, end of season, perfect time to fly out here because there's not many runways and you are, you know, you can be uh, pretty, uh, pretty certain that if you lose the lift, you'll be landing in a field. But I knew where the fields were. I'd done my research. And so I went out there, I, I was relaxed most of the time and that's the key thing. You just, it, you just, you know, Tom mentioned the flow. The flow is so important. You just kind of there, you were making choices along the way. And uh, I don't, you know, at one point I decided to get into the, the 14ers, there's nine of them out there, into the middle <laughs> section. And I saw a cloud street open up to the ones, to the far south near. Yeah, Mount Aeolus and things like that. And I said, now is the time to do it. You'll never have this opportunity again. Cloud base was, you know, 16,000 feet, which is kind of kind of low for out there. But I just said, go for it. You, you know, you, Tom, Tom mentioned it, you know, if you don't pick them up, you don't want to make yourself unsafe, but you, got, you know it's going to be two, three years before you have this opportunity again. And so you just kind of exploit that i was quite prepared to go out to you know i came into lake city as tom's highlighting here and i just saw that it was you know there was a cloud street running up to mount aeolus 
which is uh, actually just coming in and focus here. Thank you, Tom. And I got I got out there. I was relatively low, but I knew I could land at the old Bal Air Airport, which is out there. And I was just prepared to land out. And so I got there and I was at Mount Iolus and I was below the below the top and I saw maybe a hundred ravens launched off the side of Mount Iolus as a just an indelible memory in my mind. A hundred ravens launched off. And I said, oh, that was just circling there. And I didn't think ravens were good soaring birds. But I, so I knew if I went there, I, I had a chance. And I just went over there, climbed out. And then I realized that, you know, if I got, I, if you see, I come out to Wyndham Peak and Sunlight Peak. And then I just drove back, you know, I just climbed out of there and I drove back to the middle section of the 14ers and just picked those up and, drove onward to the ones that near Gunnison. But it was just an incredibly memorable flight. Who uh, built a tunnel for you through Sunlight Peak? What's that, sorry? Who built the tunnel for you through Sunlight Peak? Uh, yeah. yeah, I was kind of a man of elders, so I was kind of, you know, how it is, Clemens, as you, you know, if you're doing these things and you've got little experience, you know, you, I, you know, you're not, you, the great thing about this challenge is you can pick up the ones around, uh, out of uh, Salida along the Sangre de Cristas and north into, along the Collegiate Peaks. But if you're, if you're relaxed about these things, you just have a mindset, you're in the zone, you know you can land at the, you know, you know you can land at uh, Val Air or if it, you know, or go out to uh, the airport, was it Gunnison or whatever down, or not Gunnison, uh, what's south of there? Uh, the, anyway, you know you can glide out. And so just relax, just go with the flow and you can, you can pick these things up. So then you went back and did Handys and Umpumbagri? Yeah, that was kind of like a commitment. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it, that's, it wasn't that's, made in an unsafe manner. It was made in the manner that I'm here. Yeah. It's, it's kind of safe. There was, I knew, as I said before, I'd already driven by a place I knew that I could land. And I had that in my computer always as a, you know, as a, a spot that I could glide out to. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was, you know, when you're below the top of Elvis, I was more worried that I was out here and I was gonna gonna be another two years before I got out here and I'd I'd have to do it all again rather than yeah. hey I'll just pick it you know I'll just keep on trucking and I climbed out just you know just to the uh, just to the west of Mount Elvis and so I'll go back in again you know so that was my mindset. Yeah. Well, that was a brave, uh, a, a very brave flight. It's not one that I, 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 I never had the desire or the opportunity to fly from Aeolus to um, Compagre. It was always a, a space that I had never found anything that was reliable enough because I, yeah. it's too But I, I, Tom, I picked up the, the ones around Telluride with, I, I stay with Nick Kelly, this place after a Parowan encampment. Yeah. And I picked up the ones local to Telluride, which you kind of, mm -hmm. you can't see Telluride when you're out there. It's kind of like over the, over the hill in the, you know, and you, you couldn't glide, you pretty well couldn't not glide out to Telluride Airport. No, no, definitely not. Yeah. So this, these, the ones you did last were probably, I think the hardest ones. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's you know i think i did that in two or three flights or something but it was like wow there's no way to to do you know red mountain and handies and aeolus at the same time it's just you can't see it it's just way across and it's such high altitude there i, I wonder what the base altitude of that is that that area between uncompagre and, and aeolus it's probably 11,000 12,000 feet yeah. isn't it i think uh What's it? Uh, Bob Ferris said to me, and Bob can chime in that this is the most isolated place on North America and the continental United States. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I would agree. I would agree. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. I love um, the self surprise. Not, not, yes, not, not a flight I would have ever done. And uh, congratulations again. That's really great. So, also, the, at Lake City, where you see just in, in there, there is a runway. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's down on the on the bottom side here, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's up on the side here or something. Anyway, can't really see it. But there is there are places to land down there, but you still got to get over the. Get over the hill to get there. So, yeah. they they good ones to leave to the end. <laughs> yep, yep. You don't have to do that ever again. Yeah. No, yeah. that's that was my part of my build process. Yep, yep. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So, uh, I think we're pretty well finished up. Anybody have any questions? Or I think we went about double time here. Can, can you talk real briefly again about the performance disadvantages, advantages of say, you know, the club discus versus your ASW 20 versus flying Collins, uh, you know, discus two versus 18 meter. Um, you know, how, how dramatic is it between an 18 meter ship and the discus? I'll Could you have done this in the discus? I'll comment on the discus. Yeah. yeah club discus is go great. Yeah, you could you could have done this flight at club this is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I think it's just a little bit different when you're pushing wind or something like that. Yeah. That's been my experience. It's like if you have to absolutely push something that you don't want to be doing, it's good to have flaps, and it's you know maybe a two percent you know benefit, but it just seems it's confidence building, right? rather than I don't know if I can get there. It just takes that extra few percentage points, you know, for flying above 80 or 70 or whatever. And, uh, and the landing uh, benefits too. You can really get low and slow and with, with flaps. Gotcha. 18 <laughs> meter, I can't really comment on 18 meter. I've never, I've, I've flown the DG, but nothing else. Um, you're gonna have to comment on, on climbability and, and glide. Colin, I, I don't know about that. That club hey. is run great. Yeah. 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 Co hey, Colin, what hey. are you replacing your discus two with? Uh, I've got an ASH 26E, which I'm going to wow. take delivery of in the end of the month. So wow. Motor, so motorized, you know. And I, I, I just want to got, got you all here and the, the president sitting in the top left-hand corner of my, my screen. I think we did fantastically well as a club in the OLC uh, this year. So, and so one of, the, one of the good things we could do is have enough tow pilots at, on the weekend at midday so we can launch the fleet. You know, that's, that's going to be a critical... Uh, a critical item in our future success. Hey, Tom, some little birdie told me uh, some time ago that you might be putting together a soaring camp at Crawford. Uh, well, I did in the past. Um, I think I think I'd definitely be open for that, but I I believe we're limited on tow arrangements there. They stopped towing. Um, our DPE out there took his airplane off insurance. He had a, had a really nice uh, scout that he was towing with and they haven't towed for two years now. Um, but I do hear from the guys in Carbondale that somebody in Basalt may have a tow plane. So also also, we can always, you know, get uh, a club ship, or we can we can get uh, Bob Lynn. He's very flexible, you know, for things like that. To come out and tow five or six people. That works really, really well. Yeah, because if so, we have a full SSB camp, we'll take one of our own tow planes. I mean, right. mainly the the Pawnee because of the yeah. uh, altitude and so on. Yeah. I think I think what would be super what, what I'd like to see from the new pilots, uh, as well as some of the some of the other folks, is that they've that they're really current, and that they're 
they're going after goals and they're and they're moving through a goal program, whatever it is, right? Before we get into terrain like Telluride, um, I, I think it's would be super important to take the DG down there, you know, in a mentorship program, because you know that is really tiger country, and it's really you know best to take people to slide it. Slide is difficult enough, right? Um, and and when 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 I see you know, uh, a group get put together and half the people aren't really, in my opinion, current. Uh, that's not motivating for mentorship and it's not motivating for me for safety. So I, I think we're attaining, we, we have the possibility to attain a safer, more current culture given, you know, things like this, uh, you know, more active safety mentorship and attention to detail as well as maintenance and all those things. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, think, I think in order for us to go places and be safe, we really, really need to be current. And that, I just haven't seen it. So I'm open to helping people. I'm open to fly with people and, you know, get them trained up a little bit. So when they do go places like that, they're not uncomfortable or I'm not uncomfortable with them being there, you know, with club equipment. Tom, do you hear me? Yep. Oh, this is the first time ever I speak on this. What did you say about a possible, uh, this is a small dimension, India, Lima. Uh, what did you say about the possible tow plane in Carbondale or Basalt? Basalt or Carbondale, I, and I'm not sure which one. You know, those guys out there had a tow plane this last year. And Ooh, somebody, somebody no was, reason, yeah, yeah and, I, and I didn't catch it because it wasn't really relevant, but it seemed to me that, uh, Dave Rasmussen out there had a line uh, on somebody who was living there now. And I believe it was in Basalt. I'm, I'm not positive. Well, there are no airports there. I fly out of Rifle. I live in Glenwood. What airport were they using without me knowing about it? It might be Crawford. I'm not sure. Oh, that's a different story. And by yeah. the way, uh, David uh, Rasmussen is buying a 26 and he's right. going to push it with me and Rifle. Oh, good. Yeah, great. Yeah, I saw his airplane is for sale. So. Yes, yes. And I think he's getting it from Vermont somewhere in March, and uh, he'll come fly out of rifle. Right. And uh, the guys in Steamboat are, are kicking around the idea, I believe, of a tow plane of some sort. Well, um, that's another thing. There's a guy there, the guy, uh, the guy that called uh, Bob... Uh, I can't remember his name. He bought a 182. Right. Roberto was trying to uh, talk him into putting a tow hitch yeah. on it, but he wouldn't do it. It's a half a million dollar airplane with all kinds of equipment. Actually, he called me about flying and he yeah. told me that. So yeah. right now, there's no tow plane in 100 miles from rifle right. <laughs> that I know. Right. So I think that's, that's always going to be the problem and, and it might continue because it's, uh, you know, everybody's buying these motorized gliders, you know? So, you know. Uh, Tom, if you ever get stuck in the Western Slope and you land in rifle, I can at least give you a car tow. I have a 500 <laughs> meters great uh, uh, tow rope mm -hmm. that took me to about 1400 feet every time I used it in the past before I had a motor glider. And it's there with me and rifle. I can give you a car tow there. <laughs> okay, that's great. I was out in Meeker and I was looking at rifle there a little bit, but the smoke was too bad. I wasn't going to go that direction. But uh, yes, I, I, I know you're there. And uh, someday, <laughs> someday maybe I can get out there, but not land out. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. And you said you're looking for company when you're around the Aspen. Well, try to call India Lima. I fly almost every flyable day. Last year I flew 60 something flights and 300 and something hours. Yeah, I've called you before. We've, we've chatted a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. My, ac my, my accent isn't, isn't good over the radio, so. Well, not any worse than mine, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's good to hear you out there because it's, uh, you know, it's, there just isn't much going on. You and Steamboat, you know, it's about the only thing. 
So, yeah, I met with uh, actually Alpha there, uh, Roberto, many times over rifle and over Beaker and mm -hmm. Craig. I flew with him quite a while. You know, I have high hopes for those guys out there because they're finally starting to, I think, figure it out what, where they need to be and what they need to be doing, you know, and their skill set is, is, is getting pretty good. I mean, Roberto's had just some stellar flights out of a place that most of us, you know, most people can't even get out of. And he's done a really, really good job out there. That club is oh. doing really well. And I think the minute they get a tow plane, we're going to be seeing a whole, uh, we're going to be seeing some good, good camaraderie from those guys doing longer flights. Well, well, they're not getting a tow plane. Well, the, probably the plane, not. I know exactly what <laughs> Roberto's plane was, and this guy is not going to put a tow hitch on his 182. Yep. He decided it. Well, if it's, if it's, uh, if, if they don't get one in the next 12 months, there might be one delivered to them. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Hey, Tom, this is uh, Jason from Steamboat uh, chiming in. Um, hey, Jason. How you doing? Hey, good, man. What's the rough cost to have, uh, was it Bob Lynn fly in and, uh, and, and just do like a, a tow clinic for a weekend? I mean, we're, we're looking at maybe a weekend camp out of uh, Kremlin and, and one out of Granby just to kind of explore some new territory and options and see what's what's available. So trying to figure out how many people it's gonna, it's gonna take to support that, uh, that cost. You're gonna take the uh, machine there to launch you, the winch? No, no, we'd like to, uh, to hire the, the Boulder tow pilot. I think his name was Bob Lynn, is that correct? Yeah. The, the last the last bill I got from Bob Lynn, I think I took uh, three toes or so, maybe three, yeah. And it was like 175 to two and a quarter. And I don't believe that he, he included, I don't believe that we had to pay for his hotel or anything. I don't remember that. So um, I, I think he just adds it to his, his tow fee. So it's pretty reasonable. Right. It's, what it's, airplane does he have? He's got a scout. Oh, yep. What, what, what's your uh, feeling and experience about towing out of Granby, Tom? I know oh, you've done it. Just fabulous. It was probably the closest I've ever come to die with our president of anybody in my life. <laughs> but, you know, it was pretty damn close, but no, we, we survived it. It was a uh, crosswind, crosswind uh, from the north. Uh, you know, coming off the end, I think, uh, you know, the power airplane wouldn't have had a problem, but, you know, have a glider behind it, it was sort of sketchy. I don't think I hit my wing on the, on the, on the pavement or anything, but it was pretty, pretty rowdy. Um, I think it'd be fine. I think if you find a place to land out down below, that'd be really good. And I think there are places right below, right below the airport, you know, in case there's any problems, but it's a west takeoff only. You can't take off to the east. Um, and you have to land, you know, from the west to the east. It's a one way in, one way out. Um, but there's no, I, th there there's a bunch of stuff to land in that's probably 800 feet below the top of the Granby uh, strip. Right. Right. Um, some of it's pretty. Some of it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think right. it, I think it gets pretty rowdy there. I think I think it's uh, it's not it's not for you know club people, but I think you know the rest of the folks here could probably handle that. You know. Yeah. All right, uh, hey Tom, thanks so much. I mean, we're we've got some wonderful feedback here on on on, on this talk. It it has really been uh, really. Uh, uh, let's say over the top <laughs> in terms of the 14ers and uh, and thanks so much. Uh, we probably do need to have a conversation sometime about uh, uh, having camps and and this is a good you know using the, the zoom is probably a good way to do it. Uh, can you go ahead and, and uh, stop your uh, view here so we can see everybody sure. who's left. Thank you, sir. Uh, so anyway, want to thank you. Want to thank everybody. The the great questions uh, that we got some uh, other folks from around Colorado to join us, and and that's that's great. Y'all are welcome. 
uh, to be here and, and hope to see you again on other seminars uh, or other uh, ground schools, I guess. Uh, next week, uh, we're gonna have uh, our uh, 18 meter, the national 18 meter champion, uh, John Seaborn, and he's bringing in a guest, uh, Rex Mays, who's the, 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 the uh, Sliker dealer. And they're gonna talk about uh, ship maintenance which maybe it doesn't sound as exciting as flying over 14ers, but it's something that our club really needs to, to get back in the groove on. We, we kind of lost our uh, maintenance uh, edge due to the pandemic year. And, and even the year before that, uh, we had slipped for weather reasons or something on, on some of the maintenance. So we're kind of behind on the maintenance. Um, so Rex is gonna give a talk and then uh, John is going to, uh, uh, I, I hope take out the big whip here and uh, get, get, our, get everybody motivated to uh, get our maintenance back where it should be. So I uh, hope to see you all next week and uh, uh, we'll have another good presentation. And Tom, this, this really, it was, yeah, man, it was terrific. So yeah, it thanks. was fabulous. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you so thanks, much, everybody. Tom. Yeah, yep. thanks. Pleasure to thank do you, it. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for, thanks, Colin, for setting this whole challenge up. You know, there's a lot of excitement for it. So it's excellent. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So good night. Fly, fly safe, everybody.